for me, if you want to talk about building a parallel economy, creating a competitive marketplace in the space of ideas, there's no better place than to start right here because in the education space, Hillsdale has been that disruptor. I mean, it's 178 years in that space, but in the last 20 years, it is the model. If you don't like the way things are, you can sit there and complain about it or you can go out and do something, build something different, tug at the country. I subscribe to the theory that we live in a constitutional republic so brilliantly designed that every time the pendulum swings a little too far, the gravity of the American people pull it back. And throughout history, that's happened. The 60s gave us Reagan in the 80s, right? And I think we're at that moment now where the pendulum is just pulled to that maximum point and the gravity of the American people will bring it back. There are some challenges, right? We know them. We just went through a week of challenges and maybe a month of election challenges. I don't know when election day became election month, but it is now. Um, but I want to start with the election, and I want to, I'll come back and tell you a little bit about my profession and, and where we are. Um, there are a lot of positive signs in all of the disappointment that I'm sure many of you feel today, right? Um, but the mission of this election was to put a block at the Joe Biden presidency in the Biden agenda, and if the House holds on, which I think it will by two or three seats, um, the Biden agenda will be stopped dead in its tracks for a couple of years. That slows things down for Republicans to figure out how they're supposed to win elections in the 21st century. And the truth of the matter is, Republicans are running elections that are in the 1996 to 2008 strategy zone, and the Democrats are fighting in 2040. They have, we play checkers and chess, and they play battleship with nuclear armed weapons. They have changed the rules of the game, and Republicans said, good idea, and then they, we don't play by the rules. And I think this election, more than any other, has the potential to wake up the Republican Party to realize that if you want to get on equal footing, you got to play by the rules of the game. It's great to be principled, Ronald Reagan once said, but you never unilaterally disarm. And when Republicans dropped out of getting into the absentee mail ballot game where it's legal, by the way, I'm not suggesting illegal activity, if you give up, you've given the other side an advantage. And the way the other side has changed the advantage is you now can bring in ballots three, four days after election day, and you can cure them for seven days afterwards. They're still fixing ballots in, in Nevada. People can come in and fix their ballot. I know France must be laughing at us right now because they get it done in a day. But um, the rules have changed. The Republican mindset hasn't. I think this is the wake-up call for them. They did two elections where they were convinced they could beat the absentee ballot vote uh, with day of vote, and they have now failed two times in a row. And I think the truth of the matter is there's a thing called, in politics called low propensity voters. That means someone who will not vote unless you make it absolutely easy for them. Uh, if you have a couch potato at home, that is usually what we call a low propensity voter. They will not get up and go to the ballot box, but if you give them a stamp and an envelope and you drop off the ballot application, you deliver the ballot application, you come back when they get the ballot, and then you nag them until they give it, they eventually will vote. And that's what the Democrats do. The Democrats don't do much illegal. They do some things illegal, but um, usually what they do is they run an operation. It's, it's, a, it's a vote counting operation. If you were counting customers, you'd know how many customers hadn't bought the thing that you wanted, and you'd go out and get them and market them until they bought it. That's what Democrats do. Every day they go down to the registrar office and find out who are the people that got absentee ballots who haven't voted that look blue, and then they go out every day and harangue those people until they vote. Now, there's a big issue with that, right? You gotta wonder whether it's free will voting anymore when that sort of pressure is applied on you. But that's all they're doing. Uh, the, the elaborate ideas of significant schemes, the Democrats aren't capable of pulling off a massive scheme. They tried it with Russia collusion, it didn't happen, right? It's not possible to pull off a grandiose scheme where multiple machines do things. They're doing old fashioned Tammany Hall ballot box stuffing using absentee ballots. And the pandemic gave them that accelerant to go out and change the rules. And if Republicans want to do it, there's really three simple things. I wrote a column this morning and I looked at how Ronald Reagan reboot after losing the convention to Gerald Ford in 76. And he spent a four year window. And by the way, when that happened, everyone around him sounded like probably everyone you're talking to in the last couple of days of the election. It's over, Ronald. No 69 year old guy is going to run in 1980. It's not happening. Good run. Be happy. Go home. And he, he's like, no, I'm not. I feel the calling of God. I'm going to. And he wrote this amazing letter to one of his followers saying, sometimes failing is God's greatest way of ensuring you eventually be victorious. And I think right now, as you're sitting here, think of what Ronald Reagan went out and did. He realized a couple things. One, I got to modify my message. It's a little too obtuse. It's a little too for the 
the top of the intelligentsia of the conservative movement, it needs to be brought down to the dinner table because politics is one at the dinner table. So all of a sudden, all of those ideas that he and Goldwater talked about in 64 that gave rise to the Daisy Child ad, you know, that sunk Goldwater, Ronald Reagan retooled them. And he said, you know what, my message is gonna be, there's an evil empire and we're gonna defeat it. It's that simple, an evil empire. You don't wanna be like those guys. You don't wanna be trapped behind the Iron Curtain. And we're gonna win through a very simple concept called peace through strength. Simple dinner table concepts. Republicans talk past too much of the independent and everyday Americans who don't have time to think through Paul Ryan's 500 uh, deck um, uh, PowerPoint presentation, right? They need it simple. Kevin McCarthy put out a really wonderful thing called the commitment with America, but it was actually war and peace for Republicans. It was 150 agenda items. Who has time to read that? Newt Gingrich had it down to 10 simple things, and you knew what they were. Donald Trump had it down to one simple thing. I'm gonna build that wall. Right? It's got to be simple. Republicans make this complex. They unilaterally disarm on an election front, where, by the way, they were complicit in, in passing all those laws. Pennsylvania Republicans were in charge when you got absentee mail ballot. Michigan, same thing. Wisconsin, the same thing. The Wisconsin Election Commission, which is probably the worst and most corrupting um, idea ever created in election politics in a state, was created by a Republican governor. As a solution to solving the Democrats' prior cheating, he created an entity that created new cheating, and they changed the rules. It's a simple fix, and while you're all depressed and you say, okay, I understand Republicans are a little off the mark, here is what happened that you haven't been told by the news media. First off, Republicans won the popular vote this election. That hasn't happened in a very long time. They won the popular vote, 53-47, the day after vote for Congress. That's a big achievement. Unfortunately, they want it really big in Florida and not so much in Pennsylvania and Michigan. So there has to be an adjustment going on. But when you can win the popular vote, it means America wants a change, of course. Now, those same people who voted, and I don't, don't ask me to explain why, but the same people who voted uh, to put Democrats back in office, some who can't even speak full sentences, also said by a 70% margin, this country's on the wrong path. Now, there's a little disconnect there, right? You're on the wrong path, but you just put one of those guys in there, that's keeping us on the wrong path. We have to figure out why. It's a pretty simple reason when you get into Pennsylvania. We'll just use Dr. Oz as what, I've, I've interviewed over 100 people since the election and I've tried to drain the best ideas. Um, most of the experts I talk, let me say, what happened with the enthusiasm of the Trump movement is we created national television stars, MAGA heroes, but elections are won at the local level, right? And you have to be able to appeal to the local mores and issues. And there's two things about Keystone State residents. There's some Pennsylvania people here, right? You, you know this, right? Yeah, well, right, that's right. I, I was just talking with you. Uh, Pennsylvanians are really proud of Pennsylvanians. They don't like carpetbaggers. Dr. Oz is a carpetbagger. Secondly, it's a very strong, staunch pro-life state. In fact, it's the only Democratic state that continues to send a pro-life Democrat to Senate. If you put up an outsider who's waffling on abortion inside a state, you end up losing the, 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 the authenticity of your candidate. So a very simple adjustment. A different candidate, maybe McCormick, they probably win that race. And now we're not talking about the end of, a, of, a, of another Democratic Senate. So a little bit of adjustment on candidates. There's a lot of stars in the Republican Party, but making sure you match the stars to the races and the mores of the local race. Get in the game on absentee ballots and fix some of the messaging problems. We, people want simple promises and they want you to deliver on them. And uh, Republicans had this obtuse message that they dumped in the middle of August, which is not exactly time to get messaging. Uh, and it was just too dense. Make it simple. We know what we want to do. We're a freedom-loving country. We're going to restore freedom. We're going to get your budget down, and we're going to make sure that your kid doesn't get indoctrinated by some bureaucrat who thinks they're your child's parent. That's all they had to do. And the people who ran those uh, races, Brian Kemp ran that way in Georgia, uh, Ron DeSantis ran that way simply in Florida. They won by large margins. Those who waffled or tried to fit in a 250-page uh, uh, campaign platform, you get lost in the, in the mix. And so they failed to make the connection that you need to make with voters to, to win this race. But there's a lot of positive data. Here's something interesting. Married men, unmarried men, and married women all favored Republicans for the first time since Donald Trump's race in 2016. Unmarried women, mostly under the age of 40, voted for Democrats by a 72% margin. So Republicans are talking past one very important demographic in America. It's fixable. And abortion exacerbated that because the Democrats were smart and got abortion 
uh, uh, ballot initiatives in five really critical states, including Michigan. And so that brought their vote out in a different way. Republicans could have done a parents' right thing. Heck, they had the legislature. They didn't do a parents' right initiative, right? That would have brought Republicans out in droves or made uh, moms and dads rethink, do I really want to vote for a Democrat? That reminds me, I got this kid issue with my school that I want to deal with. They missed opportunities. But these adjustments on the dollar, what Ronald Reagan did from 76 to 77 to 80, and you saw what happened in 1980. And if you remember the way he simplified his message. That's what Republicans have to do. Two or three simple messages, stick to it. I believe the country is slightly center right. And if you can connect with the language and the simplicity of what your promise is, I think this next election will do real. There are a lot of good biorhythms in this election, just not the win at the top of the level. They have to adjust. And so we'll see what happens. I wrote a column today with six ideas. We'll see if, um, if the Republicans do that. But a lot of people think there's a simple adjustment to getting back to where I know you probably all want to be. All right, so I really came here to talk about what's wrong with my profession. So if you have the next three or four days, we can get the first chapter done. Uh, but it's, not, it's going to take longer than that. Um, I get asked all the time, how could it be that we are now in a country where a financial services company feels bold enough to say, I'm going to deduct $2,500 out of your account without your permission if I think you've shared something on social media that's disinformation. That actually happened two weeks ago. Fortunately, they were shamed out of it. But how did we get to that point? How did we get to a point that for two and a half years a presidency was side railed by a story that was never true? Not even remotely true. Russia colluded. People say, boy, John, you must have done a really, it, it never was true. It wasn't that hard to disprove. FBI agents were saying, it's not true. It's not true. And yet for three years, it was allowed to sustain and torture this country and stop a president from potentially being su a successful, a president that you all voted for. Some of you come from Missouri here, right? I, mean, I know I met a couple people from Missouri earlier, right? Yep, there, yep. Um, you had a, a popularly elected governor that was indicted and removed from office on a charge that turned out to be dreamed up by the victim. And the prosecutors knew it was false, but they proceeded with the indictment until they could get him to resign and then they dropped the indictment. I just got documents the other day that showed literally the level of sophistication that took the will of the people of Missouri and stole it from them. How does that happen? How did we get to this point? And the short answer is, it goes back to a meeting in the early of spring of 2001, shortly before 9-11. Uh, we had just been through the hanging election of the Florida election, Bush v. Gore, Bush won. The Democrats weren't happy. And George Soros and people like him convened some of the elitists in the party and said, we have to solve this. And the, uh, the diagnosis was Republicans have done a great job over the last 20 years since the rise of Reagan of owning the narrative in America. They had direct mail. Richard Vigory put stuff in your mailbox every day and got a conservative message to you, and you liked it. Got talk radio, Rush and Sean and Mark and all those. Talk radio was a dominant force. And they had Fox News. And quite frankly, Democrats could not compete in any one of those three mediums. They tried with MSNBC. They tried with direct mail. Uh, they never could succeed at talk radio. Al Gore's thing was a disaster. So they, they, they knew there was a moment where the communication channels were going to flip. And in these early meetings in the spring of 2001, this is all reporting I did about two years ago before I started Just the News, they came to the realization that Republicans own the narrative, you own the narrative, you own the election. Now, they had a couple of interesting good bets. First bet was they had this idea that there was going to be the advent of digital communities and that the Democrats should go there and own them. By the way, that's what we now call social media. We didn't know what to call it back then. But there were going to be these digital communities. People were going to band together, find like-minded people, and talk to them all day through their devices. That was a good bet. They figured it out, and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube came along, and the Republicans got there. And if you remember the 2008 race, John McCain was going on the trail and doing his uh, Straight Talk Express, and Barack Obama was getting Sharon Stone to give you a personal birthday wish on your Facebook page. I know which one I'm going to uh, take quicker. It's not going to be John McCain. I can tell you that right now. The sophistication of, of immediately co-opting uh, social media to make a personal message, make Barack Obama personal to you, is how the 2008 race was created. They called it the digital tether. That was all invented in 2001. And there were two or three premises that the, uh, that the liberal elites who had these meetings as post-mortem uh, settled on. The first was, if you own the narrative, you can own the action. If you own the action, you own the election. Just think about how Donald Trump got side railed in this thing. They owned a narrative that wasn't true. They got the action of a special prosecutor, and Donald Trump basically lost the election in 2000. In 2020, 64% of people still thought that he had colluded with Russia, even though he had been cleared. That's how powerful owning the narrative is.